first Rabdari lecture series. Um, the hope is that you have all come here today having listened to the first part. Of, so uh, the way it will work is the Rabdari series, every Rab will have a chapter and every chapter will have different parts to it. The first part of hosted last week where Guruji demonstrated the Rag that we are going to discuss today, Rag Abhir as a Dhubai. So hopefully you have all had a chance to listen to that. And today we will have a discussion with Sriman Guru Arjit Mohanavis on that Rag, the history of revolution. So this is the next part in that series. So welcome to the very first one, chapter one, Rag Abhir. So <coughs> for, uh, in today's discussion, we'll be discussing Rag Abhir. And uh, I just wanted to ask Guruji to maybe shed some light on, assuming that we all have heard the rag already, uh, just shed some light on the history or the origins of the rag, how it came to be, um, how did you discover it? And like the scale of Dipalati, but using a Komal Rag. Um, in addition, there is, in the literature, there's one composition that's available, uh, and that's available in Marikun Nazamat, um, and is attributed to Vatkande. So that's what is available. That's not a lot. Um, one way to look at things is to understand that the name Abhir sounds very much like Abhiri. Right? They seem to share an etymological root. And um, Abhiri is a very important raga of Carnatic names. Now, when you look at Raga Abhiri, there are, uh, there are many compositions, but really there, there are two that are of importance to us. One is the very famous Tyagaraja Priti Nagumumu, um, and the other is a Dikshita Priti called Vinaberi. Vinaberi is not sung very often, but Nagumumu is. Now, in the the recorded history of <coughs> Rag Abhiri in South India, uh, the indication is that in earlier times the Raga used to be sung with a Komalda. Right, so. Clearly, we have two points now where things seem to line up. The name Abhir and the name Abhiri look very similar, and they seem to share, to have shared a scale in the distant past, or maybe not so distant past. There are recorded examples of Nagumamu being sung with a Kumalda, and the few times that I have heard Veenaveri being sung, it's always sung with a Kumalda. So that's so that leads us to believe <coughs> that one of two things has happened. Either this rag existed in both the systems of music, um, and in Carnatic music, it got altered, right? The Komaldha went away, it became a Shuddha And today, when you hear Nagumamu, when you listen to most Kritis in Abheri, it looks very much like Bhim Palasi. So it may, may have become altered in Carnatic music to look like Bhim Palasi. There's another raga, in, just incidentally, just to cover our bases, there's another raga in Carnatic music called Karnataka Deva Gandhari, which is supposed to look very much like Bhim Palasi. It has the same notes, the same uh, scalar structure. So in the past, <coughs> now there isn't a distinction being made uh, between Karnataka Deva Gandhari and Abhiri, but in the past, they were considered distinct entities. Therefore, th all of this is circumstantial evidence that lends credence to the idea that Abheri in the past used a Komaldha and um, probably shares an ancestry with the Hindustani Raga Abhir. Now, having said all that, as I said, there is very little evidence in the Hindustani literature to suggest that this Raga even existed. 
And the scant literature that does exist, um, like I said, the only available composition is attributed to Bhatkande. Now we, uh, there are, there's another theory that one can come up with on this front now. We know that Bhatkande was deeply, um, was deeply influenced and was very enamored of the um, organizational and um, f sort of foundational structure and foundational solidity of Carnatic music. And he studied it very deeply. And it's quite possible that in his studies on Carnatic music, he came across this raga called Abhedi and um, brought it into Hindustani music via this composition. One can uh, get further credence, uh, kind of give further credence to this idea because in Marifun Nagamat, that composition is referred to as Abhedi, right? So it's possible that Abhedi became Abhedi and then the E got dropped and became Abhij. So either of these, either of these possibilities, um, it, it's not improbable that one of these is, is, the, um, is the history of this raga. Now this one composition um, doesn't give us a lot. I'll sing it for you so you can hear it. Um, and we can, we can talk about it a little later after that. <coughs> hmm. so this composition is a Japtal composition. That's the material that we have to work with. That's it. Um, when you're looking at a composition like this, okay, let me back up a bit. Um, so, as I said, from a, a scalar perspective, the rag 
essentially looks like Bhimpala through the Komal Dhap. This is Ashuddha Dhap. So the scale of it is. <coughs> Yani sa ga ma pa ni sa sa ni da pa ma ga re sa That's what it looks like uh, as far as Aro Agro goes. Now Subhara uh, additionally indicates that the Vadi of the Raga is Pa. Right, so the vadi of the raga is pa. The samvadi is probably sa. Pa sa. So that means that if this looks a lot like bhimpalasi, and it has that pa sa combination, it's actually closer to bhimpalasi's twin raga, which is dhanashri. Right. So. <laughs> If I sing uh, Dhanashri, Dhanashri would look like. So one can theorize that based on what Subhara was saying and based on the scalar structure that this is like Dhanashri with a Komaldha rather than Bhimpalasi. <laughs> That's one way of looking at things, but that's not where the story ends, is it? Why not? I think the the handful of us who have had the opportunity to learn this rag from you in earlier discussions, uh, the f the way the rag was discussed at that point was very. It was a, it was either bhimbalasi with komaldha or asavari with bhimbalasi structure. Hmm. So it was taught. With the so this is the first time that you are discussing the dhanashri end of it that might have that might be uh, within that rag. So when you had earlier discussed the rag with us at that point in time, there was this asavari bhimpalasi sort of ideology going where there was a very strong. Th when you gave us talim in the rag, there was a very strong element of asavari. Um, so the that's correct. So. I want to say two things about what Krishna has just said. One thing is that um, when you're dealing with um, aprachalit ragas like this, ragas that are not commonly heard, uh, interpretation of structure becomes a very important aspect of exploration. And if you look at the literature, you'll find that uh, for unknown ragas or lesser known ragas, oftentimes there's not one version, but two, three, four, five versions of the same raga. And part of that is because they are unexplored, there is no uh, popular meme for the raga. There's no way of looking at it and saying this is the meme structure of the raga, that this is what everybody is singing. So co commonly, these are the things that are defining of that raga. So part of the challenge in dealing with an aprachalit raga is to explore all possible avenues. And so based on what Kishan is saying, there are actually three different ways of looking at 
abrir. So that's that's one thing I want to say. What was the other thing I wanted to say? The other thing I wanted to say was that classification of ragas is also a very important aspect of what we do. And this particular raga is classified as an asavri khat raga. And therefore, one has to go out of one's way to make sure that it fits within the thought. Right? So there are certain characteristics of that thought that have to be accounted for since it is a raga of the asavri thought. Do we all understand why it's asavri thought? Why? Because if I look at the tonal material of the raga, right, I've got <coughs> so if if instead of looking at the raga as skipping re and um, dha going up, if I think about putting them back, what what notes would I put back? I'd put back Suddhare and Komaldha, right? So if I have to make the rag Sampurna, Sare Gama Pada Nisa, Sa Nida Bama Gadesa. So the tonal material of the raga is to be drawn out of Asavari Thad. That's, that's the scale of Asavari Thad. Therefore, when I present this raga, there should be some hint of Asavari in what I'm doing. There should be some hint that it belongs to that thought. So how do I bring that un, uh, bring that in? If I look at this particular composition, It's not until the very end that an Asavari phrase comes in, right? The very end I see. <laughs> there I have a little bit of Asavari. But in fact, when I look at the composition, I'm singing it wrong because what's written is. The point is that this particular composition and I analyze it from the perspective of where it's coming from, I see dhanashri in um, gama pada pa, right? If it, if it was dhanashri, it would be and that's not there, it's komalda. That's coming in from dhanashri. Um, it starts from ma. Kind of like the modern day Bhimpalasi. The ma being important. This is happening. Bhimpalasi. So this composition is, is demonstrating aspects of Dhanashri and Bhimpalasi. And it doesn't necessarily very strongly suggest Asavari. So as a counterpoint, I've written a sargam that I would like to sing for you. Sorry. <coughs> Bye. 
that's from the sum i'll sing the antara one more time ma ma pa pa ni ni sa sa ga re sa ma ma pa pa ni ni sa sa ga re sa sa ga re sa ni da pa ma pa sa sa ni look at this composition carefully you will find there's a lot more asavari going on right so sa da pa da pa ga re sa ga ma pa the ga ma pa is not but the so one way to think about this is that if i look at the raga from an arohi structure then it suggests hanashri vimpalaki very strongly if i look at it from an avrohi structure it suggests asa very very strongly so how you want to interpret it is up to you you can look at it as purely dhanashri vimpalaki you can look at it purely as asa very you can look at it as a mix of things clearly at some level it's got to be a mix but um the beauty of working on aprachalit ragas is i when i sing it i sing more dhanashri vimpalaki when kishan sings it he sings it more asa very but that's an interpretation kind of thing and both are rag bhakti so uh, i think this is an important uh, point to be made and this is a a point that will come up multiple times throughout this series and these discussions that um there are there's a belief that rags have one swaroop there's a belief that across the ganana within one shishya parivar within one branch of any line of gurus or gurus and their students that a rag is to be preserved and presented one way and that is the chap of that rag so the way the guru sings it is the way the student sings it and so on so forth seeing as this series will have many anvat rags and many different rags and rags that are, have so much scope for interpretation on the on behalf of every individual person who sings it what are your thoughts on this particular phenomenon and how do how do you feel differently about the situation and if so i do um i feel very differently about it and i'll i'll give a couple of points on this the first is that um especially for anvat ragas for aprachalit ragas often times our knowledge on these ragas is codified in composition in many of these rarer forms there might be one composition or two compositions or three compositions and that those compositions because they have been written by great masters and have been sung by generations of masters the form of that composition at some point it becomes very difficult to distinguish between what is the rag and what is the composition um this is particularly true in carnatic music actually but it's also very true for the anvat aprachalit ragas of hindustani music um and that is that is not that is so i completely disagree with the idea that a composition should define a rag secondly the analogy that i have always made and i'll continue to make is that a raga a viable raga a real raga a strong raga that can be sung for a good period of time uh, has particular characteristics particular um it's got a personality it's like a person right and so um uh, you and i can know the same person it's more than likely that that uh, that person unless they're very unidimensional is going to interact with us very differently right it's always a give and take how i i talk with rashmi is going to be very different from how kishan talks to rashmi or how dobby interacts with rashmi <laughs> or how sailey interacts with rashmi like it everybody has a different way of interacting with rashmi and as a result rashmi will also interact differently right we interact or we re re respond to stimuli uh, that we receive from others right and therefore a raga <laughs> you know my intellectual uh, formalization of it is going to be very different from how kishan formalizes it or any one of you formalizes it 
does that mean that there will be no relationship between how I look at the raga and how one of you looks at the raga? Of course not. Of course not. After all, I'm the one teaching it to you. Right? <laughs> there will be things that you will pick up. No person is going to be completely different from, and uh, that's actually pathological if a person is different with everyone. You know, That's really strange. That's not normal. So a raga is like that also, right? The raga has a core that is essential to it. But then how it interacts with you is very much a function of your understanding of its as aesthetics and how you interpret what it is. So, so in order for a raga to be viable, let's think about let's think about the great ragas of Hindustani music. If we think about Malkon, Darbari, Bihag, Yaman, Yonpuri, all these big ragas, days, every every musician who has studied these things very carefully has his her her own way of looking that at that raga, right? I mean, uh, no two of them, no two great recordings of the same raga are going to sound exactly the same. So why is it that an aprachalit raga should sound the same from person to person to person to person? That doesn't make sense. Does that answer the question? This is an aprachalit raga. We've covered um, the phraseology and we've talked about the shape of the rag and its influences. Um, at this juncture, there are two questions that come to mind which aren't quite related to one another, but um, I'll ask them anyways. Based off of what you've said about how the rag has an influence, you can see it as Dhanashri Bhimpalasi, you can see it as Asavari Bhimpalasi, Asavari Dhanashri, any combination thereof. Would this rag be qualified as a jord rag? Mm. There are different types of jord rags. This can be thought of as one type of jord rag. When we when we talk about jord rags, mm, there's a set of jord rags, like for example, Basan Bahar. Hmm? Yes. <coughs> <coughs> kind of a jod rag has very defined regions that belong to one rag or the other and it's quite literally I'm juxtaposing the two next to each other there's something slightly and I, I think there's a negative connotation to this word <laughs> I don't want to carry the negativity of it but there's slightly something schizophrenic about it right it's got a it's got a dual personality um, those are interesting and oftentimes they can be very expansive, they can be very interesting. Um, sometimes they're very small, right? And then there's a set of jord rags, for example, um, <coughs> like joke cons. <laughs> Now there, Jog and Chandrakons have been melded in such a way that it has its own character. And you cannot really see the distinct, I mean you can, if you are, if you have studied these rags very carefully, you know exactly what phrase is coming from which rag. But the composite of it is an identity of its own. So I think that uh, this rag is more like Jog Kons than it is like Basan Bahar. But it's such a uh, unsung rag 
that it needs to be sung more, it needs to be performed more, it needs to be practiced more, it needs to be taught more for us to gain a common understanding of what that composite personality is. It is a Jorda, but of a sort. Uh, since we're on the topic of, you described there were three kinds of Jodhras. Since it's been mentioned, could you just give an example of what the third type Did of Jodhra is? Did I three? Is that three more? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I take that back, but we can, we can uh, We can do a session on Jodhras. On Jodhras. Essentially, there's Chaya, Chaya Lagat Ragas, there are Mishra Ragas, uh, and then there's proper Jodh Ragas like this, and there's different categories of these. So we'll talk about it more then. Okay, so... Um, bringing it back to uh, understanding the rag, giving it a shape and seeing it. As you mentioned that this is an aprachalit rag, this is an anvat rag. Um, it's not very commonly sung, there's very few sources on it. Uh, as I understand it, this rag was, uh, you have, you found this rag in, in, the, in the texts that you have, especially Subharao, and you've also mentioned the composition by Bhat Khande and Mari Purnagamat and, uh, and from Ekpustak Malika. Um, but there's, there must be a, and as, as you also mentioned, there's no recordings. This is very limited, uh, limited literature on the Raga. So I understand that, that you worked with your guru, Shantaji, to bring this rag into something or bring some sense of understanding or structure to that Raga. So can you discuss what that process was like mm -hmm. of taking it from a book or just a, f a series of sentences that might describe that you can count on your fingers and then one or two compositions and turning that into what you've done. You've also written compositions with Shantaji and you've expanded the rag and its literature quite a, a, a great deal. So what was that process like and how did that? Um, first of all, I would say that this was quite a while back. So my memories are a little bit foggy. Um, and I, if I if I remember correctly, I wasn't even aware of Bhatkande's Abhir, Abhir composition okay. at the time. Um, Shantadi had a book, had <coughs> uh, a copy of Mari Nagamat, which she which she very kindly gave me. But that was much later, and it was quite coincidental that I saw it and went, oh, okay, so this exists. So literally, all we had was the blurb from from Subarao. Um, what was the motivation for this? The motivation was essentially, I sang the scale a few times, and to me it was very, very curious, very curious, that if I have a Shuddha there, I'm able to create all these different varieties, right? <coughs> Durbalati, Dhanashti, and then offshoots of Dhanashti Ang is a whole large set of rags in Hindustani music. So this ang, if I just put a shuddha dha there, it creates, an, uh, it creates a starting point for an ang that produces lots of different rags. So my curiosity was, why is it that one note causes this whole thing to be so obscure? So I, um, I tried singing it. Um, this was, YouTube was around, but it wasn't widely available. I think I managed to get a hold of one recording of uh, Musuri Subramanya was singing Abheri in the old style. I heard it and I said I couldn't make heads or tails of what was being sung. It was being just into my ear and then it sounded um, coherent. Um, and I think that was deeply influenced by the fact that um, I heard that composition very widely sung with the Shuddha Dha. So if, you, if that's what you're exposed to and suddenly you get this recording, something's not sitting right, you know. So um, I was just very curious why something is non-viable because of one thing only. So then I, I brought this to Shantadi's attention. And so you've, you've been to her place. You know that um, a lot of our, our talim happened in two ways. One was in her music room and where we would uh, go back and forth working on a rag, she would correct me, she would teach me a composition, she would correct me, correct me, and then I'd understand something about it. And then a lot of our talim happened at her dinner table, <laughs> right, where we'd sit and talk about what was on our brains musically. And that even to this day when I go to Seattle, I find myself in that position sitting there that I have a seat at that dining table, which is mine. <laughs> 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 and all our dialogue happens and I sit there and, I, and we talk about whatever the two of us are thinking. 
this was definitely something that was on my mind when I had brought it up. Uh, and I asked her what she thought about uh, trying to make this something more viable. And the composition that we came up with, which is the blooper that is in the other recording, um, my thought on that was that, um, um, you know, the great composition of Carnatic music is Nagu Momo. Can we write a drupad that looks like, con uh, in uh, um, content-wise, looks like Nagu Momo? So I got a translation of Nagu Momo, and I um, I'm terrible at Hindi and Braj and whatever. So I came up with something, and I looked at it, and I thought, that's terrible. <laughs> but I gave it to her anyway, and she looked at it and said, oh, OK. <laughs> 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 then we called her, her dear friend, uh, Dr. Nassim Hines, who's an expert of Urdu and uh, Braj. Uh, she's a great uh, scholar of these languages. And uh, I think uh, my version was shared with her, and she was was very kind. And I was I was made aware that this was not a good piece of anything, <laughs> <laughs> which is good. But then, to my great great amazement, um, the following week, I went back to Shanta Deep, and she said, "I have something for you." So we sat at her dinner table, and she gave me this text. And this text was a translation of Nagu Momo in her own poetry. So um, Shantadi is really underrated when it comes to her uh, language ability. She's just an amazing, amazing um, creative mind. And when it comes to language, she's got a command that is actually quite astounding. It's just that she doesn't uh, make a big deal out of it. So anyway, but she gave me this, and um, I took it home. And uh, I think my conception of what the rag might look like was starting to solidify. And at some point, I said, what the heck, let me try and write music to this. And so I wrote it. And it turned out OK. I took it to Shantari the following week to thank her, because yeah, she's a very good friend. Um, so that's that's how that's my recollection of what happened, um, but also along the way, um, I also uh, visited with Professor Ramesh Gangoli, who's another great scholar of linguistics, as you know. Um, we talked about this a little bit, uh, and then we discussed having a few sessions where we all came up with our own compositions. So I remember he wrote a Lakshmi Geet in this rag, which I now I don't have in my room. Um, but he had a different perspective on it also. Um, but so the three of us sat together, Shantadi, I, and Ramesh Ji, and um, we all sang what we had. So th these kinds of exchanges slowly, slowly, slowly sort of crystallized in my mind what I felt was the structure of the rag. So then the next thing that happened was I gave Talim to you, I gave Talim to Harkirat and uh, Asagri. Asagri. Uh, not the rag person. <laughs> After teaching you guys, my thoughts really consolidated and formed into this particular entity. So I think I like to believe that what was published this week was a good representation of a very coherent idea of the rag. But that is still, as, as coherent as it is, it's still if open to. If anybody comes up with a completely different interpretation of this rag, I will be the happiest person. So uh, one of the really unique things about being your student is that being your student, we get exposure to four major gharanas. We get exposure to Jaipur, Gwalior, Agra, and Kirana. And that's just for the Khayal side, Drupad side, there's many other styles as well. Um, it's become fairly, as far as my understanding is concerned, it's become fairly well known that um, every ghara, any given rag in any given gharana has a flavor of its own. It has, uh, it brings out a quality of that raga that might not exist in another gharana, and that's. Um, does that apply to this rag? Is do you think that something like this applies to this rag? Where cello, mm. we've talked about Dhanashri, Bimpalasi, Asavari as the three major factors. Is that is gayaki? a factor in which rag comes out more or less no, in this particular it's case? It's. Um, I don't. 
I don't feel that the Gayatri per se um, changes the rag in this particular case, but particular compositions evoke certain yagas, right? Um, so, for example, Sangali, um, you know, so it's. <coughs> Because it has a strong uh, Dhanashri Ang, and in my ear, uh, when I think of Dhanashri, uh, Pandit K. G. Ginde's version really sits in my ear. So, sing this composition, I feel that, that Agra, um, that particular aspect of Agra comes out very well in this. As you know, there are other compositions which we'll, we'll eventually hear uh, that evoke Jaipur, uh, that evoke Dagarang, that evoke, I don't know, whatever that Tarana is. <laughs> but every composition, uh, the composition can be written from the perspective of a Gayatri. The rag is larger than a, and so, you know, I know, uh, there are certain rags associated with certain gaiti, certain gharanas. I think it's incumbent on musicians who are serious uh, searchers of the music to think about how those ragas morph into their gaiti without changing them. Um, it's one of these questions where uh, I can get up on my soapbox and pull forth for two hours, <laughs> um, but I won't in the interest of time. What I would say is uh, 
the the music is subject to the same kinds of pressures that popular music is uh, that carnatic music is um, i mean that any any musical form that we can think of in india uh, is subject to these same pressures and what are those pressures the pressure essentially comes from the fact that there is no longer a a strong um, uh, patronage system um, and the old patronage systems were defined by um, individuals and institutions that um, wanted to intellectually understand the music right whatever we want to say about uh, rajas and maharajas they were serious about their try trying to understand the music um, you know uh, historically, historians historians will poo-poo somebody like Muhammad Shah Rangila. I would say Hindustani music would not exist if not for Muhammad Shah Rangila, right? So um, these individuals were very serious about trying to understand the music at a very deep aesthetic level. That's largely gone away. So the patronage now comes from concerts and just like Bollywood, just like any popular form of music, just like Carnatic music, it's that which is familiar with audiences want, right? So the very sad thing about this, this is where I need to not get on my soapbox, is uh, the shrinking audiences that we deal with in Hindustani music have an understanding of the music which is very small and very limited, right? The popular audience maybe understands dozen, 18, 24 rags, 25 rags, max right and these rags don't come in that late right at some point you get tired of the green palashis and surya ganashis and maruti halves and madhu hantis and <laughs> when you're searching for real music those rags go by the wayside and then you come across things like this that provide very deep aesthetic rich experiences like you said but are not like that you know, that are understood by a very small number of people is it incumbent on those of us who can sing and play instruments at a very high level to bring these rags forward? Yes, but we'll do it, right? I mean, you risk your career as a performer and musician if you do too much of this kind of thing. I don't have a good answer for you. I, th I what I do think is because there's what I do think is um, that um, the system of rags is not well explored. So there are these corners that if people invested and decided not to sing Surya Ganashi, but sing Abhir instead, decided not to sing Maruti Hal, but sing Abhir instead, audiences would enjoy but it's too much of a chant. And so that unexplored corner remains unexplored. It's hard to say. Either either of those possibilities is possible. It's hard to say. Um, the it the vanishing of compositions, of course, as you know, we've talked about this in the past. It it happens because uh, repertoires were limited to uh, where the the transmission of repertoires was limited to selected individuals, and compositions vanished. Rags vanished. Um, is Abhir one of those rags possible? Or it's possible that Bhatkande found it in South India and felt like it, it had scope to be a North Indian rag and went to the South. It's hard to know which of those is true. The question was, um, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> um, 
a rag like abhir provides such a rich aesthetic experience is there a particular reason why it has not been uh, popularized to, to date is that does that capture it broadly about our facility rather okay. but in particular uh, so we have a, a question from our online viewer. Uh, do you feel like the chaut so we've written, you have written a series of compositions spanning rags, I mean spanning tals within this rag, aside from the uh, literature that's already there. Um, from what you've written and how you performed it, do you feel that the chauta composition from the recording brings out a, dis a different aspect of abhir that is less or more prominent in the jhatta? And if so, what aspect? <laughs> this is such a good question. Um, <coughs> if you'll notice on the in the Chautal, <laughs> the first nyas is on Ma. So the allusions are to Asavari. Those of you who have studied Asavari with me realize that I look at it very differently than Jon Puri, right? So these are all Asavari phases. That's the first look at so the only time that I am doing an Arohi phrase is when uh, Krishna is being extolled. Otherwise, we're all falling. So, Asavari is much more dominant in that composition than Bhimpalasi. Whereas Sangaliye is very Bhimpalasi Dhanashri oriented. Okay. Okay. Does that answer the question, whoever asked it? If not, please write back. <laughs> of course, it doesn't. <laughs> Um, so just a, a follow up to that. So then maybe not across gharanas, but agro across different styles of the same rag, there is going to be a difference in the weight of proportions of Anwar George rags in that. So in the gharana side, on the gharana side, the answer wasn't so much that it was in that case. It gets towards the fundamental nature of Tali. So I won't answer that question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Are there any connections between Abhiri and Abhiri Todi and in your research in your research <laughs> and reflections? Ah. No, they're very different rugs. They are very different rugs. Um, I'm not well equipped to discuss Abhiri Todi today, but I will make it a point. Whoever asked that, I'll make it a point to get back to you. Was that Atul? <laughs> I'll, I'll get back to you. So um, I think that uh, thank you so much. Um, that uh, concludes. Oh, okay. So the question is just to for the documentation. The question is: Does this belong to a particular season? Does it belong to a particular time of day? Okay, <laughs> um, I think that when I'm singing the rag as I did in the recording, I'm not following the parsa um, vadi samvadi uh, stipulation that's in Dubba rag, right? Because it's more, uh, I know you think it's not, but I, there's a very strong flavor of asavari in it, right? So. If, if it were to be a Dhanashri Ang Raga, right, then it's kind of an afternoon Raga. 
but if it were to be an asavari angraga it's a morning raga so i would place this as a late morning early afternoon raga yeah so late morning early afternoon raga does it belong to a season no it not per se abhir alludes to uh, a tribe that is associated with krishna right milkman milkmaids cowherds so one can loosely say it's kind of like a springtime holy kind of but it i don't get that feeling out of it but the name itself is a krishna a vaishnav name does that answer your question Um, so the question um, has to do with um, sort of the vibrancy of the music, and what Murli is saying is that one has many ways of trying to make the music uh, creative and um, uh, living again. Um, and two ways that Murli suggested is one can try and create one's own ragas, or one can try and revise what is there. Um, so in my uh, in my humble opinion, very few new ragas have succeeded. Um, and when we say success, right, uh, that's usually measured in terms of a raga breaching gharana gayatri identity, right? So a rag like uh, Yogkans has proliferated across gharanas and gayatris. It's gone into dhrupad. It's in khayal, obviously. And therefore, it can can be considered to be a successful new rag. It's no longer a new rag, but it's relatively speaking on the scale of time. It's a new rag. Such rags are very few. Very very few. And it turns out, with all due respect to Jagannath Bua, it's not a an original creation. That same scale exists in the literature under the name Gangeya Bhushan, and it is sung. And it is thought it is a uh, very important rag of Dhrupad. So, and it's definitely there in Carnatic music also. So, therefore, um, what one can say about all this is that no matter how great our understanding of music and no matter how deep our scholarship, there's very little that remains untouched by a human mind. There's not much that one can really come up with that's new, and and the stuff that one comes up with is so so odd, right? That it has no chance of viability. So let alone cross uh, gharana um, uh, proliferation, I think the other standard of whether something is good or not is whether it lasts for three generations and generations, and very few of these do. So therefore, having said all that, creating new ragas is not something that I consider to be a viable pathway for two pieces of music alive and going on. On the other hand, as I the factors that I discussed earlier have meant a shrinking number of ragas that are being performed on stage. And this is exacerbated by the fact that our performances are typically evening to late night. And so a very small subset of ragas is performed and 
you know at some point I will talk about my belief on the time system and how we've got it exactly backwards um, but putting that aside um, the because there's a shrinking number of ragas that are sung the number of ragas that are out there that remain unexplored or have not been recently explored is growing you know it keeps growing and that's where the creativity lies that is where the creativity lies and especially if you have a situation where you have a very skeletal framework like you do with Abhir then a musician's thinking a musician's creativity a musician's uh, approach um, to aesthetics can truly make something amazing fantastic so that's that's what I want to leave that's that's what I believe is the viable pathway to a healthy vibrant art Prachalit. Yes, very much so. Very much so. And uh, that's very clear if one looks at um, the repertoire of, um, of musicians, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was much greater. The number of rags that were being sung were much greater. The number of interpretations of the same rag were much greater. And one of the things we will explore is uh, just to sneak peek next the next thing we will tackle the next raga we'll tackle is rag abhogi right and those of you who are who are familiar with this music are going what's the big deal about abhogi everybody knows sare you know the sare gama da sa sa ga ma ga ve sa everybody knows that well that's not the whole story <laughs> there are there are multiple versions of that raga some of them completely unexplored and um, Clearly, there, since there's a compositional repertoire, there used to be some, and now it's not. No, this particular set of, so one of them comes from Carnatic music and the other does not. Um, Carnatic music, there's a s limited number of cases of this. And it has to do with the, uh, you probably know, the Tyagaraja and the Shita Sampradaya, and it has a different nomenclature and slightly different definitions. That's where that comes from. It's very well defined, the subject we are talking. Hindustani music is a whole different kettle of fish. Sorry, apologies for the detail. I guess that uh, concludes it for the first chapter of the Rag Daddy series. Uh, thank you once again, Guruji, for having this session with us. Um, all these lectures and all this information will be available on YouTube very, very soon. And uh, on that note, we hope to see you all at the next lecture that will happen, and you will all be informed about that through email. So on that note, thank you very much, and have a good night. <laughs>